and everybody for staying out. We had a fantastic presentation. Who saw Vincent's talk earlier? Yeah. How awesome was that? All right, so in the tradition of restock, we're gonna be pushing the envelope some more. This is a kind of a uh, ambitious presentation from Shane Danger. Uh, you know, he's, he's talked about uh, present, uh, propagating at your frag days. We wouldn't have a reef stock if, it, if this guy hadn't laid the groundwork um, through the frag days. Thank you for staying out here. Today's response from the reef aquarium community in Australia is phenomenal. We're already getting dates for next year. One, one thing that's a little bit surreal is we've managed to essentially transplant virtually exactly what we do in Denver here. This room, this crowd, the corals, the energy, this feels like Denver. It's so, so, so great. And I can only set the stage, but it's up to all the vendors to, to show up, all the exhibitors and manufacturers to bring out all the cool stuff. It's up to you guys to have faith in the first time. Obviously, now that you've come here one time, you know that next year is going to be that much more special. And um, I, I want to reiterate for the camera that we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the frag days that Matha started, for the community that Shane Danger has brought together. You know, he's a nucleating point, but we're all part of a bigger whole. So um, he has worked his butt off. He's, is this your first PowerPoint presentation? Yeah, I took a look at how to use PowerPoint. <laughs> <laughs> this, guy, this guy worked really hard. He worked really hard to take his knowledge to the next level for you. And so he's gonna do some tricky stuff. As you see, it's taking just a couple more minutes to get this started. So please help me in giving a warm Reefstock Australia welcome to your hometown hero from the Gold Coast, <laughs> Shane Day. Pretty much, you've seen it, you've done the laps in the crowds, there's loads of frags out there. And, uh, yeah, probably <laughs> And, uh, you guys our YouTube video? And, uh, yeah, so basically, I want to give you a bit of a demonstration as best as I possibly can uh, to show you how to frag and just tell you everything I'd like to know about fragging. So, um, yeah, basically, a little bit about me. Uh, as I was talking about before, uh, Matha, dabble with it a lot. It steals literally all of my time. Uh, Black Box Reef, the <coughs> side page thing I used to log my tank on and been doing it for around 15 odd years. Um, and uh, yeah, various scales, different sort of uh, levels. And the last probably five years, I've really got my teeth really sunk into this. Um, so yeah, so loving it. Um, and yeah, so today my intentions, I want to encourage you on a frag um, because it's great, it's fun, it's rewarding. Um, you, and yes, I'll show you what those rewards about later. Uh, teach you the safe practices because some of you may be aware of the toxins and things like that. Uh, present to you a range of equipment that we can use, um, which is, yeah, all of the possible hand tools and things like that. Tomorrow it will be a bit of a different type setting. No hand tools. So, yeah. Uh, it's a right or wrong way. There is usually a right and a wrong way, but it's uh, also about finding ways that work for you. There is so many different ways you can cut a coral and so many different ways that it can grow or, or work for you, and it's what works for you and what works for the coral. Different species need different ways you can frag. Um, and yeah, fragging techniques. Show you as many as I possibly can today with a very small bucket of corals to practice on. But uh, yeah, get there. And uh, tips that I've learned. So like I said before, about in the last five one years, I've really got stuck into it. And um, yes, yeah, so I've been trying to learn as much as I possibly can about it. And I want your feedback because um, it's my first round doing it. And um, yes, yeah, so I don't know if it sucked or if it's good, so yeah. <laughs> um, cool, so coral fragging. What is fragging? Uh, it's short for fragments. Um, any way you can cut up a coral, a mother colony, anything like that, taking small pieces off it, they will grow out. There is not a single coral that I've come across that can't be fragged, including things that were deemed impossible to frag, like tracky, scully, um, heliofungia, they're all possible. Um, so yeah, that's the act of propagating the corals, so taking plant cuttings, we propagate coral. And uh, that was a <laughs> fun way of fragging. 
Uh, these are some frags. <coughs> See plenty from out there today. Rainbow Monty, Zoas, and all right. So aquaculture, a um, bit of a side sort of thing. So this is the uh, the practice of doing fragging in a, in enclosed systems and uh, in an aquarium setting. And uh, yeah, so cultivating any aquatic life can be done in it, but of course today is about fragging corals. Um, this applies to hobbyist levels and commercial, so I'm going to show you some techniques today that will mainly apply to hobbyist level, but the same stuff applies to very large scale operations that people use in um, mariculture even. So, yeah, uh, mariculture. And anyway, why do we frag? Um, preservation of rare coral varieties. So, uh, things like that just don't come up here, rainbow chalice or something like that. It, they don't come out of the water very often, so we want to frag it and spread it around, more people can have it. Uh, insurance policy. This one is very important to me. Um, if you lose a coral, it's, it's gone. If you frag it and sent it out to a few people and shared it around with your mates, which happened to me quite recently, I had a coral that was uh, had it for around about 15 years, came on a piece of live rock that I cycled my tank with, I lost the mother colony and probably about two years prior I'd sent frags out and I was able to get one back and I was absolutely stoked because it's like my little, it's 15 years old, it's been in my tank and I was devastated when I lost it. So that's one of the main reasons I frag is to make sure I can always have the corals I have. Um, so ethics, it's environmentally friendly um, <coughs> as much as collecting wild corals is very sustainable. Um, if we can minimise all the impact on the reef, it'd be great. One day to be completely sustainable would be fantastic. Um, you can recoup the costs um, by fragging again and growing out your own frags and yeah, buying new equipment once you do it. Uh, train names is a fun one. Uh, it's yeah, some people take it with a grain of salt with the giving fancy names to things. I think I used to be a bit on the fence with it, and now I'm fully for it. It's just a fun aspect of the hobby to give things like. Rings of satin and all this kind of crazy names. It's, it's just cool. Um, and legacy corals. So um, there's corals that just don't quite come up in wild, co in wild collection much anymore. It sort of goes with what Vincent was saying before, how corals change. But Dallas, it doesn't get collected anywhere. Um, and there's a few other varieties that just don't get collected. But it's probably because it's morphed in, a, in the aquarium setting. But at the same time, we share those around. Uh, and uh, yeah, this social aspect, so coming to these events, frag days, anything like that, uh, and even just getting mates around, having a few beers like we do at one, have a fragging session, and yeah, for that. And a uh, bit of an obscure one, fragging because it's got like tissue loss and things like that on a coral, you can often amputate it to save it if it's progressing quite fast along the, the uh, skeleton, you can cut it all off and it saves it. All right, safety, the big one. Um, glasses, gloves, and the respirator. The respirator is not so much worn by me all the time, but gloves and glasses, yes. Um, respirators are good for, especially if you're using like a, a power tool with dust and things like that. Um, and also, Zuen and things with calitoxin, they can become airborne and, if you're really hacking at it. So yeah, those big three. Um, safe practices. <coughs> so they alone are great, but if you can do some of these things, you can uh, minimise any risks to you. Well ventilated, so in here it's not ideal, so that's why I'm not using power tools or anything. Um, tap or a garden hose in case you do get it in your eyes or anything like that, you need coral dust. And don't frag near others. And I know there's a few people here, but I'm pretty careful. Um, yeah, all right. So the reason we have to be safe is because of palytoxin. It is very toxic. I think it's like the second most toxic substance on the planet. And it's, don't want to scare you with that, but it's very easy to minimize all the risks. Um, it can become airborne. Pretty bad symptoms. You don't want it. I've had palytoxin poisoning a few times, and it's rough. <laughs> um, so yeah, so think about safety and minimise risks. You don't want to be, yeah, keep your concentration tongue in when you're fragging. You don't want it in your mouth. And yeah, so exactly, just be aware of it and make all the measures that you can to be 
decipher. All right, coral stings. Um, not everyone's going to get these. I know people that are quite lucky and they can pretty much rub corals on their hands and they don't get stung. I'm one of the unlucky ones and I come up in welts and stings from it quite highly. Um, so again, don't be scared of it, be aware for it and prepare for it. Uh, fragment tools. So there's a whole range of stuff here. Um, bone cutters, so I'll go through them as we... Yeah, bone cutters. Uh, another type of bone cutter here uh, for a crescent cutter and good for acro. Scalpels. Um, with the replacing the blade, that's really important because if you don't have a sharp blade, you're going to hack at the corals and do more damage than actual clean cuts that they help it heal better. Uh, a chopping board, which is under here, very handy for not cutting into tables. A uh, hammer and chisel I didn't bring because it's we're not going to be able to use it today, but it's very handy for breaking the rocks that the corals come on. So once you've cut the coral, you can break the rock underneath it after. Tweezers are very handy for doing single polyp zoophrags because they can be a bit slippery when you're wearing gloves. It can be a bit cumbersome to try and get them out of your things. So very handy. Uh, scissors. Great for fraying a variety of corals, like soft corals, leathers, and things like that. Onion bag, it's a bit of a weird one. Uh, oh, the pets is for dripping water, but onion bag is great for holding loose coral frags down and see with the coral frag underneath it, run band and over, and it lets it attach. Uh, alternatively, you can get these Gallery Aquatica Silver. Um, there's quite a few picking around now, but yeah, they're a little trap that you can put loose corals in and they attach over time. And buckets, glues, and towels because it's always a mess. <laughs> a little bit of a better setting than that. Uh, frag plugs. We have huge amounts of frag plugs available to us now. Discs, all sorts, piles, everything. DIY. Um, there's lots of ways you can make your own out of plaster or out of cement, things like that. Uh, you can cutting up old coral skeletons or rubble and stuff like that. Uh, novelty ones. Uh, I thought I'd throw this in there as a bonus. You see those uh, like skulls and things like that encrusted with Sephastria. Some people like that. I'm personally not a fan of it, but they look all right some days. So yeah, um, we have a lot to work with. Uh, these type are cool with the divot in there because it holds the glue. There's quite a few coming out nowadays with the little divot in the top there. Uh, alternatively, uh, those ones in the top corner, I have that, those ones. They've got the rough surface, and they're a preference of mine as well because the, the glue sticks to them a bit better. So, yeah. Uh, glue some putties. We have a whole range. Uh, my personal favourite is this ME glue. I've used it for quite a long time, and that's a gel cyanoacrylate. It's very good. So, any gel cyanoacrylate is great. Epoxy putties, less commonly used for frags, but it still works. It's good for acro and things like that. You can sort of set and forget while you work on other stuff. Uh, cement, less commonly used again. It's more commonly used in uh, wholesaler and large scale settings where you want to really pump out a lot of frags really quickly. Um, and poly beads, they're a heat plastic bead that you heat up in hot water and you mold it together like plasticine. Again, not very commonly used for fragging, but they do work. And these are some of the, the ones I've used recently. So, yeah. Uh, frag racks. Uh, we have heaps. You can use standard egg crate like that. Um, with the observed lighting and flow conditions, one of the most common things I see is frag racks right at the top of the tank, and your colonies are midway down or on the bottom of your tank. So you've fragged a coral that's come from a low light, and then you've just put it up, you've damaged it, you've hurt it, it's trying to recover, and now you put it right at the top and you're burning it. So you try and keep your frag racks in a similar setting to where the corals actually come from, and you'll uh, get a better success rate. <coughs> yeah. <coughs> or even better, a dedicated frag tank. So you could even plug that into your main display, keep all the parameters the same. Um, these are some custom made things, so yeah, all shapes and sizes, you can custom make them or buy them like that. All right. This is the, the camera part. A piece of Monty to frag up, which put on there. A couple of morphs here. Uh, they're actually a fluffy Rhodactus. Some Zoas. 
a Rick. And this acro. So you've seen them I'll uh, yeah, chuck them back in the water. Alright, I'll start with the Zoas. And uh, actually before I start all that, iodine dips. Uh, this is a consistent reef dip. Uh, iodine based dip. It's post fragging, it's to me it's a must. It helps stay off your infections and things like that. It, it could happen in the coral. So this is my dip bucket. Pour a little bit in and mix it up and it goes clear. All right. And uh, yeah, so I'll start by these. So typically a scalpel would be easiest for these or a razor blade, but have a scalpel, it's easier. Um, to do a single polyp, um, I'm not sure if I've got it right. Right in the middle of that rack is yeah. the focus. Do you want me to put that? Cool. <coughs> All right, I think that's good. Um, yeah, so a single polyp, you want to get down, you don't want to cut there, if that's shown there, through the top of the polyp. You want to cut right down at the base of it and cut into the rock. So this is why you need to change your blades all the time because they go blunt. So you want to really cut down into the rock at the base. And then you can peel off that polyp really quite easily. If there's any little tethers, make sure you, you cut them. You don't want to rip that. Um, you don't want to rip that if you see a little uh, tether because it'll likely uh, peel up the side of the coral like one of those little skin tags and saw your fingernail and really wreck it. All right, cool. So that's that out. So a little single polyp zoanthid. Um, back in there. Um, other ways to, I guess if you want to do a larger colony as well, <coughs> so with that, if you just want to, single polyps are quite common, but a larger colony, you can cut that, find a, a, uh, a line down the middle, roughly if you want to harvest, it, say you and met your mate bought a colony at the reef stock and went halves in it sort of thing. Easiest way is find a way that you don't cut through <laughs> multiple polyps and uh, all the way through, cutting into the rock again, make sure you yeah, really ruin that blade. All right, and then the bone cutters. So I think this is glued to that rock that way. So I'll first cut that off. There's a little bit of glue under there. All right, so that cut that I made that can be seen. Um, then put the bone cutters in there and crack the rock with the two halves. So there's a little bit of a tether left there as well. So don't rip that because you'll damage the polyp. It's easy just to cut it off. All right, so that's Zoas. Um, go with, go Monty next. Uh, so these basic hand tools are super easy to use and, and you can also, something I should mention too, these uh, bone cutters, you can substitute those for electrical side cutters as well. These are very good quality ones, but um, yeah, I've used electrical side cutters for years and yeah, they got me into it, but now I've converted over those. Um, cutting with this stuff, it can be a bit irregular, so you can't really pick a a straight good line. It's going to crack somewhere, but after a little while of doing it, you can sort of gauge where it's going to crack by looking at the shape of the the um, vericae, which is the, all the ridges in the coral. Look at the shape and the way they're running. Also, any lines on the back, you can sort of use them like perforations and guess where it's going to crack. So, um, yeah, it's a little uh, that's like that. They crack very easily. At this point too, there's some die off around there. I would use that time to trim all that up because to make it a neat looking frag, you don't want it to look dead. All right, you can do another one of those. Um, see that? All right, cool. So it's super easy to cut Monty's. 
Um, Are we allowed to ask questions? Yeah, uh, I'll go at the end. Yeah. Um, all right, acro. Usually, if you're not fragging a frag, but I, for the purpose of this. <laughs> so yeah, it's a pretty pointless frag to do, but for the purpose of it, I'm basically just going to cut it off the tile to show you and re-glue it to the tile. <laughs> but yeah, again, these are the crescent cutters. I really like those for acro. That they just, it's so quick. They are really crunchy. Uh, these also work just as good, but they're really good for your bigger, thicker stags, um, stuff like that. So yeah, uh, also once I've cut acro, because it's a little bit irregular and you know you want to stand it up on your frag tile, um, that base there is, a, you can see that it's not quite flat, which makes it difficult when you glue it to the tile. If, so you can use that again this time to just gently take off any higher edges and flatten it off as best you possibly can. So you leave that as flat as you possibly can. All right, so yeah, Acro, easy, Monty, easy. Zoas can be a little bit tricky because they're a bit fiddly. Um, we'll do a Rick next. All right, so, cool, it's all in one tile. So again, similar situation to the Zoanthids. Um, you want to cut through the mouth if possible. Um, so, right, little cobra pod running around that. Yeah, so you got the, the mouth right there at the tip of the scalp blade. Um, so you basically make the cut through the soft flesh. That's done. Pop it off the rock that it's on. And then use the bone cutters to put in between that cut. And done. One brick to two ricks. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> They're a little bit longer to heal, but very viable. Um, all right. And the next one, I'm going to, for the purpose of demonstration, I'm going to peel this similar situation to how you frag this fluffy morph. Um, if you same as similar to the rick, straight through the middle and then crack the uh, rock underneath. But I'm going to peel this off if I can, because sometimes morphs are uh, it's not a really horrible uh, rock to peel it off. I do have a pre-peeled one, uh, but it just didn't look that impressive. It's all shriveled up. Uh, so yeah, it's a completely detached morph, and so I was going to basically show you those little that's where these things come into play. So you can put your frag tiles in there, put the morph in there, shut the lid, put it in a low flow area, and it'll uh, attach probably two weeks tops. Alternatively, you can put, <coughs> put the morph on the tile like that, because you can't glue morphs. They have a, a fleshy base, and they, they literally just lift off the glue. Maybe you get it there, stick there a day at best. But this is uh, an old method that I quite like. Put the onion bag over like that, and then just use a rubber band to secure it, and it can't drift away. And also, yeah, just another little technique of fixing that one down if they've detached, or commonly too, if you frag them, they even on the rocks like the rip, they can peel off as well. All right, um, I think that was all the corals. Cool. So that's as much as I can probably show you. It was a bit difficult to do it in that sort of setting, but um, yeah, works along with it. So I have, next I'll do some gluing. Basic gluing procedure. I probably will have to re-glove for this. Um, wrong. Pre-soaked tiles is the most important thing. Um, and I have them pre-soaked in here. They're, it lets, especially with ceramic tiles and stuff, they trap air inside the, the, the pores of the ceramic. And when you put glue on there, it uh, creates bubbles, looks kind of unsightly. Plus, pre-soaking the tile also makes the uh, glue set better because cyanoacrylate is using the gels. They're moisture cure, so they need moisture to set. So having it pre-soaked is just a better way to make that glue go off quicker. Um,
the uh, S. All right, getting there. That's what I'm looking for. So uh, yeah, it's going to be a bit hard <laughs> to do all this again. <laughs> really needed the split thing. All right. So the pre-soaked tiles, you'd want to pat them dry on a towel and uh, apply. This is gonna. Sorry about the no camera for this bit. Really wanted the HDMI splitter. Um, break that. All right. So once the frag tile is patted dry, put a. Uh, Good sized dollop on that. This is a really thick, it's probably thicker than honey. It's quite like why I like it. And uh, yeah, good dollop on that. Then you get the uh, coral that you fragged. Pat the base of that dry as well. And you can literally just stick that on there. Onto the rack and uh, then the, the pipettes, or the little syringe which I have today, for a little bit of water, and just throw a little bit over the top of it. And that just makes the surface of the glue skin off, and it'll start setting, so it's, um, it turns opaque colored. And uh, yeah, so that's pretty much set there. That's pretty quick. All right. And uh, the zoanthus is a little bit trickier, again, with the, uh, the size of it, that's why those tweezers come in handy. But pretty much exactly the same thing and just make sure you glue it up the right way because once you've done a single polyp, they kind of look the same no matter what way you put them, they close up into a ball. Um, all right. The uh, infection control I was talking about before, which is that iodine dip. Um, so you have all your, your corals pre-soaked in the iodine, uh, about five minute dip after the cuts, and they'll sit there and go back into the aquarium. It's pretty important. Uh, you can use Moogles as well. You can buy that, which is just potassium, iodide, and water, I think. Um, and also, just like that rib that I had before, little amphipod that run across it, when you've got them out and you're handling them, I always check them out for pests, especially Montes. You have Monty and Nudie Branch and things like that. While you've got it, you may as well look at it. And if there's little sponges and things, scrape them all off from underneath. Give the coral a really good clean while you're fragging it. Save doing it later. Um, and a clean, it's not so much, but a clean workspace. If you've got a, like a, a common fragging bench and it's just covered in filth, old dead coral scones and things like that, you can have more losses all the time from your frags. And a healthy aquarium system. So uh, you're always gonna start with a healthy coral anyway, unless you're fragging it to save it, like we spoke about before. But uh, yeah, so keep your aquarium healthy. And um, it, so yeah, good parameters and things like that. You can also uh, use dips and things like that, probiotic <laughs> dips that uh, promote healthy bacteria in the tanks. <coughs> All right, um, and after we're finished, I won't do it today because it's a bit time consuming, is rinsing all the tools because even though they're stainless, they will still rust or corrode. So give them a really good thorough rinse in water and uh, dry them off properly. And I usually use a little light smear of coconut oil um, and it just staves off any rust. So these are probably about a year old and there's no rust on them at all. Um, whereas I've seen some not well taken care of and they're quite rusty already. Um, so yeah, a little light smear of um, coconut oil and just wipe that off before you finish, uh, before you start again with it. Um, yeah, so this is uh, the rewarding part. So you frag corals and uh, now you can see them grow over the next couple of weeks once that's back in your aquarium. You can see that in crust. Um, and I'll, a bit of a fun thing for uh, what I like to do is not so much time it, but uh, see how fast I can get the full base to encrust if it's a SPS or see how many polyps grow at a certain time. Um, and that's my little reward is trying to speed up the process. Um, and yeah, so that you can't have, uh, see so yeah, testing water is super important. You've got to um, keep that healthy aquarium going. <coughs> and uh, yeah, it's, this is why we do it. Uh, finding that joy in fragging and seeing it grow, which is why I do it. And um, I'd say a lot of people would find that 
that joy in Frankie Corals. Um, and it feeds up the whole hobby. <laughs> um, Fragging your corals around and sharing them around with exactly that social aspect before. Um, I really, really enjoy sharing my corals. And uh, yeah, so that's, that's it for today. And, uh,